In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Hello and a warm welcome to all of you, dear brothers and sisters, viewers of Marjaya TV. Here you are again with another episode of the program Marjaya Horizon. Stay tuned, watching news reports and all meetings, all regarded the grand jurors Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Hussaini Shirazi. And now let's watch guidance, which it is a short clip of Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Husseini Shirazi's speech. <laughs> In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. He who does good shall have ten times as much to his credit. This is a part of the verse of the Holy Quran. Which means that when someone does a good deed, Whatever it is, wherever it is conducted, and for whomever it is done, Allah Almighty promises to give a better reward to the doer of the good deeds. Sometimes the reward of a good deed comes back to you soon. And you realize it is the rewards of the good thing that you did it in the past. According to one of the narrations, at a time of the previous prophets, peace be upon them all, There lived a woman in a village or town. She lived near the river and used to take her dishes or clothes there to wash. And left them in the sun to dry from morning until night. It was a common act which many people did in the past. The woman had a baby boy in the narration which is referred as Yadraj. Meaning to a toddler around one year or one year and a half. She used to take him to the river to play as she was washing her cloth. One day, she went to the river and took her child with herself. It has been narrated she took two small loaves of bread. As she was a poor woman, so that she can dip the loaves in water and eat them for lunch. As she was washing her clothes, she had put the bread next to her. A dog passed by. It has been narrated that this dog stood there and didn't live. The woman saw the dog looking at the loaves of bread and it seemed hungry. She thought to herself that she could eat less on that day. Therefore, threw the dog a piece of a bread. The dog ate a piece of bread and went away. The woman kept washing her clothes while her boy was playing with sand and rocks. The 
نبتی بوده چیزی مشغول بازی بود یه وقت جیغ زد بچه Suddenly, he started crying and mother saw a wolf taking her boy away quickly. Out of her motherly compassion, she started running after the wolf. Her running was wrong in two ways. First, she couldn't keep up with the wolf running, with a one-year-old boy as quickly as it could. No matter how fast she was able to run, she couldn't keep up with the wolf. Therefore, her running was useless. In addition, it could endanger her own life, making the wolf leave the baby and attack her mother herself, and she had no weapons with her. But out of her motherly compassion, she was running after the wolf, and there was no one in the desert. But suddenly the wolf, a hungry wolf, put down the baby and escaped. In previous nations and at the time of previous prophets, sometimes people could hear the voice of angels and occasionally could see them. When the hungry wolf let go of the baby, the lady heard a voice from the heaven telling her, abide for a bite. You go away, abide, and you will have a bite in return. It means because she gave a piece of bread to the dog and took it and went away, the Allah Almighty returned his favor by blessing her the favor with such a bite. Adam Global Center, a human rights organization dependent to Ayatollah Shirazi, through a message condemned the revocation of ID cards of about 72 Shia Bahraini citizens who were accused of political conspiracy. This center announced this action as a Shi sample of violating human rights of Shia and urged Bahraini officials to reconsider such based activities and to put an end to all discriminations and racism. This center also urged global community and international human rights foundation to take serious and quick measures against such matters. In January 2015, the Bahraini government has revoked the citizenship of 72 Bahrainis, most of them Shia, for harming the interests of the kingdom, a harsh response which was without a court or clear evidence. In November 2012, the regime deprived the nationality of 31 Bahraini Shias. Among them are important opposition figures on account of being a threat to the state's security an accusation that is concerned the vaguest reason for the deprivation of nationality. Also, there is no justification for equating political dissent with damaging Bahrain security. Al-Khalifa regime's practices are in clear violation of Article 15 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which states that everyone has the right to a nationality, and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality nor denied the right to change his nationality. The government has violated this human right and has added these citizens to more than 2,000 people who are currently stateless and without nationality due to regime's naturalization policies. The latest citizenship revocation of Bahraini nationals by al-Khalifa regime is one of the most notable sequel to the regime's changing demographic balance of Bahrain that has begun since 1999. Al-Khalifa regime has long been practicing demographic engineering by selectively giving citizenship to people from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Yemen and Jordan, offering them housing privileges and giving them sensitive government jobs in security forces while treating the majority Shia Bahrainis as outsiders. It's ethnic cleansing. There's no other way to describe such a demographic remapping. 
We are talking about 100,000 migrants coming into Bahrain in between 2004 and 2010 that we know of. Prior to that, between 2000 and 2004, 120,000 were artificially integrated into Bahrain. Only taking the mentioned instances of naturalization into account for Bahrain with a population of only 1.3 million people. This means that by 2012, the ruling Khalifa has diluted the Shia majority by 17%. Call it demographic engineering or ethnic cleansing. Such a strategy is going to bolster the grips of authorization al Khalifa on Bahrain, of which the king appoints all 40 members of the upper chamber of the parliament that must approve legislations, the prime minister, and judges in the addition to declaring martial law and have to write to and literally pass certain types of regulations. This leaves only the lower chamber members to be elected by Bahrainis. The sectarian policies of the regime to crack down on opposition by any means, especially after 2011 protests in which Al Khalifa regime killed more than 80 people, along with aggressive demographic displacement and discriminations against the Shia majority, has created another apartheid dictatorship in the Middle East that is prone to another social political turmoil. It is interesting to know that the Shia majority has not played the sectarian card, rather, their tent to insisted on national unity and identity of Bahrainis be it Shia or other religion. Although Bahraini opposition activists emphasizes on non-sectarianism nature of their cause, for Al Khalifa, sectarianism is a weapon to crack down on political critics. Al Khalifa's response to such consequences is cracking down on opposition through foreign military and security forces and inciting newly naturalized Salafis to join security forces to respond to anything that challenges the authority of the king. The selective naturalization policy leads to unstable and inharmonious society with socio-political consequences that can create further unrest. The dangerous practices of targeted naturalization, revocation of citizenship of Shia and sectarian discriminations practiced by Al-Khalifa is a recipe for more political backlash, violation of human rights and undermining freedom and democracy in Bahrain. It is expected that international community harmonize with the voices of human rights activists and pressure the Al-Khalifa government to refrain from such practices and support freedom and justice for all Bahrainis. <laughs>
Since the presence of ISIS in Iraq and the waves of violence swamping the country in itself, the Grand Jurist Ayatollah Shirazi asked all Iraqis to defend the country's security and sanctity. In this regard, the Volunteer of Brigade of Ansar al hujja was formed. This brigade has fought the ISIS shoulder to shoulder with the Iraqi army and freed many areas from ISIS control. Let's listen to a phone call we had with Aqil Hashimi, the general commander of Ansar al hujja Brigade. Firstly, I thank you and the Marjaya channel for the opportunity. After the call of the Grand Ayatollah, Satsadr Shirazi and other jurists in Holy Najaf, volunteer brigades of Hujja and Ansar Hujja were formed to defend the country against the ISIS terrorist group. Each of these brigades have recruited 2,250 soldiers, totaling the number to 4,500. Ansar Hujja Brigade participated in the liberation operation of Talafar in Mosul province a couple months ago. In this battle, three soldiers were martyred and nine were wounded. The second brigade is bigger, and because of this, we have ordered the sub-branches to be created, so that each city would have its own brigades and recruiters. These local branches include Holy City of Najaf, Diyala, Ambar, Nasiriya, and Basra. It's worth mentioning that the Diyala branch participated in the operation of freeing Amirli City where we had four martyrs. The ISIS that is sponsored by America and Israel is a big threat to the region. Most prone to this threat are countries like Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. In defensive operation, the Anbar local brigade lost one of its members in Fallujah city. In addition, we had three martyrs in the city of Barwan, Haditha, and the Baghdadi neighborhood. The United Volunteer Forces include young and old, and are very capable in defending the country. Following the religious authority order, these volunteer forces are putting their lives at risk in defending their nation and their country. By now, these volunteer forces have not received any financial assistance or any monthly reimbursement for their salaries to support their families. Even though the funds have been raised for the support of United Volunteer Forces, still many of them did not get any financial assistance. Moreover, the United Volunteer Forces expressed their urgent need for the latest tactical weapons in their fight against ISIS terrorist group. Our Volunteer Forces martyrs are in heaven, while the ISIS terrorist deaths are in hell. Our goal is clear, to clear off the country from the terrorist thugs, who kill and commit all sorts of crime in the name of religion. At the end, we wish that Lord guides us and support us in our purpose of defending this country, and may God protect all the religious authorities, especially the Grand Jurist and Authority Ayatollah Shirazi. <laughs> Free Muslim Organization has expressed its greatest concern in regard of deteriorating Muslim living condition in Europe, especially in Austria where Islamophobia has reached its peak in this country. In the latest Islamophobia development, some unknown men left grafty of Nazi's emblem on Vienna's mosque wall. At the same time, preparations are being made to hold anti-Islamic protests in this country. The Global Nonviolence Organization requests the Austrian government to stop Islamophobia propaganda in this country and to prevent further discrimination against the Muslims of this country. Mosques defaced in Austria and France. The Global Nonviolence Organization is concerned about Muslim deteriorating life conditions in Austria. The anti-Islamic sentiment has become far more vocal in Europe in recent weeks. The Global Nonviolence Organization, a dependent center to the Grand Jurist Ayatollah Said Sadak Husseini Shirazi, has expressed its greatest concern over Muslims' worsening life conditions in Europe. In Austria, Islamophobia has reached its peak in the country. In most recent act, some unknown men left graffiti of Nazi emblem on Vienna's mosque wall. These acts were not restricted to Austria, and in countries like Germany, French and Sweden, similar acts of defacing mosques were observed. At the same time, preparations are being made for holding anti-Islamic protests in these countries. The Global Nonviolence Organization requests the Austrian government to stop Islamophobia and the propaganda against the Muslims in this country, and to prevent further discriminations against its Muslim citizens. These concerns have intensified when anti-Islamic movements gained in more popularity among Europeans after Charlie Hebdo shootings. On the other hand, Muslims also need to build a positive interaction with Europeans and remove any kind of misconception, misunderstanding, and misreading of Islam in the countries they are living in. 
they must convey this message that no act of terrorism can be associated with Islam in any way. And now we are going to watch the most important news all around the world regarding Ayatollah Shirazi in the next part of our program, News in Brief. Public relations office of Ayatollah Shirazi hosts a general commander of Miana district. Qaisal Muhammadawi, general commander of Miana district in Iraq, attended in the public relations office of Ayatollah Shirazi in the holy city of Karbala and met with Sheikh Talib al Salihi and Sayyid Arif Nasrullah. In this meeting, Qaisal Muhammadawi reported on military and security activities against the terrorist group of ISIL and appreciated the spiritual supports and guidelines received from the Grand Jury Ayatollah Shirazi at the time of war against terrorists. At the end, this office provided General Commander Qaisal Muhammadawi a certificate of appreciation for the sake of his services and efforts. Shirazi family destroying colonial plans by the Great Britain. On 20th of Rabi Thani in 1335 after Hijra, the leading Shia Jewish Ayatollah Haj Sheikh Muhammad Taghi Shirazi issued a fatwa and stopped the colonial plans by the Great Britain in Iraq. And then, and under the name of free elections and democracy, the colonizers were aimed at taking over Iraq by the placement of a non Muslim leader who guaranteed their interests. However, the late Grand Ayatollah Sheikh Taghi Shirazi banned all Muslims to vote for a non Muslim president. This fatwa united and lifted their spirit of all. Iraqis against the Great Britain and for them out of this country. Ayatollah Sheikh Muhammad Taghi Shirazi is an uncle of the Grand Religious Authority and Jurist Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. Preaching Conference of Fatul Bayt Seminary School in Tanzania the city of Arusha in Tanzania witnessed a preaching conference of graduate students of Ahlul Bay Seminary School. In this conference, which a number of preaching and clerics from Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda and Burundi attended, the participants, along with reviewing different methods of preaching, emphasized on the hardships and problems in this regard. This conference will be held yearly by the Culture, Religious and Charity Center of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, in Africa. Construction of Fatima Zahra Seminary School ongoing in Kabul. Following the guidelines of Ayatollah Shirazi upon publishing the noble doctrines of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, to the world, the construction of Fatima Zahra Seminary School is ongoing in Kabul. According to the directors of the seminary school, the center will be opened in a few upcoming months. Arif Nasrullah to visit Ayatollah Shirazi's dependent centers in Turkey. In his trip to Turkey, Said Arif Nasrullah, the head of Ayatollah Shirazi's public relations office in Holy Kavala, visited centers dependent to the Grand Jewish and discussed with the staff of this office and culture and religious activists. In these meetings, Nasrullah stressed upon expanding the true learnings of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, through preaching activities, along with upholding rituals of Ahlul Bayt. It is worthy to say that in his meeting with Sheikh Mahmoud Tohidi and Sheikh Dugan, the staff of Rasul Akram office in Turkey, Said Arif Nasrullah was informed of the latest religious, culture and preaching activities of the center. Ayatollah Shirazi's office in Holy Karbala hosted different figures. A number of cultural figures from different cities of Iraq and groups of youngsters from the city of al attended Ayatollah Shirazi's office in the Holy City of Karbala and met with the staff of this office. In these meetings, the participants discussed over current social, cultural and religious issues and problems of Iraq. In addition, the group of youngsters from al listened to the speech of Sheikh Talib al-Salihi over significant role of the youngsters in social affairs. The first installment of the Shia Rice Watch monthly incidence reports begins on a disastrous note. With over 500 dead, almost 400 injured and dozens arrested, Shia Muslims have systematically been targeted in January. This report will analyze the data we compiled on Shia deaths, injuries and arrests that occurred between January the 1st and January the 31st. The data gathered from this report came from a variety of different sources. Bloody start to the year. Incidents of anti Shiism in January 2015. The first installment of the Shia Rice Watch monthly incident reports begins on a disastrous note. With over 500 dead, almost 400 injured, and dozens arrested, Shia Muslims have systematically targeted in the month of January. This report will analyze the data we compiled on Shia death, injuries, and arrests that occurs between January 1st and January 31st. The data gathered from this report came from a variety of different sources. This picture painted by popular media sources 
is incomplete and did not report on dozens of incidents that occurred in Iraq. For incidents that occurred in Iraq, the report consulted with Iraqi Body Count, an organization that tracks all violent incidents throughout the country. So Shia Muslims systematically targeted in four countries, Syria, Bahrain, Pakistan and Iraq. The targeting highlighted in this report are murders, injuries and arrests. In total, there have been 439 deaths, 384 injuries and 24 arrests. This does not include incidents such as the revocation of citizenship which occurred in Bahrain. The bulk of violent incidents have occurred in Iraq, which has witnessed dozens of bombings in Shia neighborhoods. As with the death, the bulk of injuries have come in Iraq as well. All of the areas have occurred in Bahrain. The large number of areas in Bahrain, relative to the other countries in this report, highlights the variations in the sources of violence against Shia. In Syria, Pakistan and Iraq, violence against Shia has largely come from militant groups such as the Islamic State in Iraq and Levant and al Sunnah wal Jama. The next section of this report will delve into the data, collected and provide explanations behind the violence the world is witnessing. The violence by non-state actors against Shia in Iraq has dwarfed the amount of violence occurring in this country. The 438 deaths and 234 injuries that occurred in January in Iraq would have made it the second most violent country of all year, last year behind Pakistan. Bombings in Shia neighborhoods in Baghdad have killed scores of people at a time. Not only do bombings in highly populated areas have high death counts, they tend to injure just as many people as they kill and leave a large amount of property damage in their aftermath. Syria. There was only one event recorded from this country, but the casualties incurred made it account for 2% of the death and 10% of the injuries. A bus carrying Lebanese Shia pilgrims traveling near Damascus, Syria, was the victim of an explosion that killed 9 and injured 37. Bahrain. There was one death and 46 injuries in this country in January. Bahrain accounted for 12% of the injuries and 100% of the arrests in the month. Shia in Bahrain are not facing indiscriminate violence at the hands of non-state terrorist groups like the other groups on the list but are rather facing repression from the government. Shia in Bahrain regularly protest the Al-Khalifa regime and they are just as regularly met with the violence by security forces. On January 31st, the Bahraini government revoked the citizenship of 72 Bahraini on grounds of damaging national security. This was the largest case of citizenship revocation since the start of the Arab uprising in 2011. Since this event did not involve an arrest, a death, or physical injury, it was not used for statistical purposes. Pakistan Although Iraq was by far the most violent country for Shia in January, the worst incidents in the month came in Pakistan. In the city of Shikarpur, roughly 100 miles north of Karachi, a bomb exploded at a Shia mosque right after the conclusion of a Friday prayers. In this incident, 60 people were reported dead and 50 reported injured. Many of the people were killed by the blast, but numerous others were killed and suffered injuries as a result of the roof of the mosque collapsing from the blast. ASWJ and its affiliates have continued to carry out targeted assassinations of Shia in towns around the country. On January 7th, a 15-year-old was gone down by this militiaman, and on January 31st, a 70-year-old man was shot and killed outside of a hotel in the city of Orangi by militants. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for Majaya TV for all their effort. Uh, Shia Rights Watch since the beginning of 2015 tried to change a couple of things in their reports. One of them was the monthly report that we are issuing. Our first report which was documented in different countries such as Bahrain, Pakistan, Iraq and Syria is contained a death of more than 539 Shia Muslims in these four countries. We have a team that is working on it, trying to gather all the information. We're going to have a monthly report regarding those uh, wounded, uh, killed, and uh, arrested that is happening in the different countries. And we try to reach the other United Nations organization to describe, uh, to tell them about those incidents, uh, ask them for help, and uh, bring all the evidence to them. Uh, people can, you know, talk to organization like us or bring us send us the information that they have so we can work on those evidence so uh, having those information can help us in United Nations and there should be a path and a way to help those Shias so regarding those 72 Shia that uh, 
Bahrain government revoked their citizenship. Is, is This is something that the Bahrain government is using to prevent the people to talk. They have to be silenced inside the, uh, inside the Bahrain without having any activities. And every time and everywhere you, we see that the Bahraini government is putting pressure on those activists to prevent them from talking. Uh, that's uh, always is good to have this evidence prepared and ready so every time there is a report issuing regarding the countries such as Bahrain we can have more evidence to pre uh, present to the United Nations. Around 80 percent of the uh, population of the Bahrain are Shia but those majority have a minimum of uh, help that they are getting from the government and the uh, government doesn't recognize them and re recently we see a lot of government is bringing a lot of people from the countries such as Pakistan, such, uh, such as Bangladesh and give them the citizenship to reduce the population of the Shia Muslims over there. So our effort is to help those uh, Bahrainis to uh, help them reach their voice to the, uh, to the UN and the West and Euro European countries to at least we can uh, in certain times and certain uh, amount we can uh, stop them uh, stop the government from oppressing those Bahrainis. The city of Arusha in Tanzania witnessed a preaching conference by graduate students of Ahlul Bayt Seminary School. In this conference, which a number of preachers and clerks from Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda and Burundi attended. The participants, along with reviewing different methods of preaching, emphasized on the hardships and problems in this regard. This conference will be held yearly by the Cultural, Religious and Charity Center of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, in Africa. In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we founded the al Bayt Seminary School in a small house in the city of Mushi, northeast in Tanzania in 1986. With the help of Sheikh Kamis, in 1988, we decided to name the school to al Bayt Center. This center has been the destination of many scholars from all over Africa, like Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, Burundi, Madagascar, and Congo. In cooperation with Said Shahada Relief Institute, we established a separate department to inquire about the life conditions and preaching activities of the graduates of Alul Bayt Center so that we can find solutions to their problems and help them. In fact, African preachers face many problems, mostly surrounding their social and economic life. Unfortunately, many people do not know about these problems. I believe if the people and the benefactors noticed these issues in Africa, then they would have helped the Alul Bayt pass greatly in this continent. At this moment, this center is rapidly growing. The conference was held at 8 a.m. and our brothers visited the different parts of the center. Then, and after long discussions, there was constant agreement on promoting Islam and helping the preachers both on social and economic grounds. We highlighted other points in this conference. First of all, keeping a sincere intention, which it purifies our actions and makes them more effective. Therefore, we as preachers should always keep in heart an honest intention. Secondly, respecting the works of others, even though they might be small tasks, since we can encourage them to increase their efforts and continue their activities. Thirdly, was keeping close contact with the grand jurists himself directly or through the Islamic media to have a prosperous Muslim society. Fourth, is to keep away from division and trivial issues so that we can all protect our solidarity. Fifth, forming al Bayt funding committee to support the preachers so that we can alleviate their economic issues. Sixth, encouraging extensive study among students and helping them to be economical with their time. Seventh, we decided to continue having these sessions Early and have more people to participate in it. Eighth, we are also planning to hold these meetings for women as well, who play an important role in forming the society. Lastly, I pray to the Almighty God to make us successful in our task, and may Lord's blessing be upon Muhammad and his pure progeny. That was all for this episode of the program Marjayat Horizon. For more information on our daily news about Marjayat, you can visit shirazi.ir and the official web pages of Rasul al Akram Cultural Institute on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. You can also watch the live stream at marjayattv.com. Till the next episode, may Allah preserve you. Bye for now.